So welcome everybody. Um, I think we should just get right to it. I will not be a participant, at least for the first part of it. And um, at some point I may jump in because I feel like it. Um, um, and I, I think our agreed upon topic is what about our present political environment is disturbing to you or you know, how do you feel about our present political environment? What are your concerns or anxieties? Uh, would somebody like to start? Should I start? Yeah, you start. Okay. Um, all right, Lewis, I'll speak to you. Uh, okay. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a timer. Uh, it's going to be set for five minutes. I probably won't use any anywhere near that much time. Um, and it'll just sound, and that's when you'll know we're hitting our limit. Um, so here we go. So I guess, I guess my concerns are that uh, I've read some studies, and it just makes sense that polarized, the, the worse the polarization becomes, the worse the outcomes become. And, you know, Ray Dalio, who's a famous hedge manager, did a big study on, you know, the last 200 years of, of political breakdowns, including a lot of work spent on uh, what happened in Germany. And what he found was, you know, if, if you get one side taking power and throwing out everything the other side did, and then the next side comes in and throws out everything the other side did, <laughs> nothing gets solved and things get worse that's so what I, uh, I'll so, so what i believe i hear so far is that um there's been a study done uh that shows that over the past 200 years the more polarization there is the less gets done and that the example used by the name i can't remember was that in germany it's especially it was shown that that when everything that one person, one leader or group of leaders or party had done, then gets thrown out by the next opposite end of the spectrum. And then again, that what you end up with is actually not any real progress, but just conflict back and forth. Is right, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. And I, that sure looks like what's, what's going on here. And I guess I also feel that, uh, you know, in all the noise, we're having a hard time actually talking about, in substantively, about, about real problems and what to do about them. Yeah, and here, we're, our example is that with those conflicts, we're not actually able to have conversations without the conflict, and as a result, we're not making any progress in figuring out how to even break through the conflict we're in. Right. I feel hurt. <clears throat> okay. You. So, um, my having done a few of these, I believe that yes, we could actually wait, choose. Wait, wait, wait. You need to choose who you're speaking to now. And it should okay. be me. Got it. Okay. And so, this is just an administrative comment. I heard the way Jessica said it, that it was as if you want to specifically speak to somebody, and I can imagine how that can be a preference, or I've also had experiences that it's, we just want everybody in, so I'm arbitrarily gonna pick the next person, which has no emotions about it being that choice, and so you, I assume you don't care which one we do. No, you, can, right? you can speak to whoever you want to, and what ends up happening is we have this weird spider web sort of kind of, like you can continue our conversation and speak to somebody else. You right. Can, you, can, you can, you can okay. say whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. It's okay. It's kind of strange conversation, but that's part of its magic actually. Great. All right. So, uh, Bill, I'll choose you. I already know Evan pretty well and we haven't yet heard of Megan can hear. So Bill, I'll just go with you. Great. So, uh, I have been a student of democracy my whole life and actually went into politics and ended up dropping out of it twice because not only 
the conflict, but what I perceive to be the lack of ethics. So start there, and then I'll go on. Sure. So um, you've been a, you've been a student of politics your whole life. You've entered actually into politics twice and dropped out twice because of ethics and also the um, the conflict that you found. Exactly. And um, as a student of it, I am one of those very strange people who actually loves the differences and the purpose of democracy to actually have free speech be able to be heard, not just as tolerance and fairness and equity, but because of the self-interest of actually learning from the intelligence on the right, the intelligence on the left, the intelligence in the center. And so what's disturbing me most now is that we're losing the calm intelligence of different perspectives in the midst of the conflict. Um, so summarize that. Okay. So um, what you're feeling is that also being a student and, and uh, valuing and studying democracy and valuing the, the real discussion and debate that goes along, the honest debate, um, you feel that um, things are, um, are, are, oh God, I lost it for a second, sorry. Uh, it's kind of spiraling out of control. And so people are taking sort of uh, tribal or team positions, red team, blue team, and not allowing a calm debate where, you know, someone from the other side might have a good idea. And really that intellectual, what's missing is that intellectual flavor and creativity that you wish. Exactly. And, and what we have instead, at least on the media, is almost... It's almost impossible to find a new a summary of the news that includes uh, a non-judgmental understanding of the different perspectives. PBS tries does a pretty good job of it. BBC does a pretty good job of it. Uh, I no longer find any of our regular commercial networks able to do it. I, I go to one and I hear righteousness mm -hmm. and judgment and I go to the other to hear righteousness and judgment, and just the energy of their judgment irritates me so much I can hardly even hear the content. So um, when you go to most of our local news outlets, um, you hear judgment and, uh, and, uh, and ignorance, that wasn't the, quite the right word, um, but, um, and, and then you, but you do like uh, PBS and BBC, who seem to have sort of, uh, at a remove, a more contemplative uh, sort of view of things. And they're not so dogmatic as you find like MSNBC, I assume, and Fox. Precisely. And even CNN now, and, 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 and all the others. And I love your choice of the word ignorance, even though I didn't use it, because my experience, not only in my personal brain and personality, but in my personal life, is that Anytime I or anyone else is highly righteous about a perspective, to me, that, that signifies an ignorance uh, because it's not possible for one perspective to be the whole truth. <laughs> and so I think ignorance and, and arrogance somehow go together. <laughs> uh, you, know, you like the ignorance because it brings out the ignorance and arrogance. And um, so, and which is... Uh, Whenever someone is, is overly dogmatic, obviously, they're not really assessing the, uh, the giving the, the measured analysis needed to, to really look and understand a problem. They're going from a dogma, which um, tends to miss things. Yeah, precisely. And given my age, I remember the days when, when the, the ethical Republicans and the ethical Democrats actually worked together with different perspectives to solve a common goal, whatever the common goal was. Um, and, and that seems to have been lost. Yeah, and uh, given your age, um, you also have uh, experienced at times when, you know, when Republicans and Democrats could uh, work together uh, towards a common goal, and that seems to be lost. Exactly, and since I felt David raised the film, yes, I understand Time's up, so that's good enough for now. And you get to choose to speak to whomever you wish. Thank you, I feel very heard. One second, Megan, can you, are you able to participate? Can you hear me? Yeah, if you, can you speak up a little louder? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? 
Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you well enough. Okay, I just wanted to know. Okay, thank you. So, Bill, it's your turn to choose somebody. Sure. Okay. Uh, Megan, I'll speak to you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm very worried about our political, almost about everything about our po present political uh, situation, as uh, you know, talked about by other members, uh, the arrogance, the non-listening, the uh, dogma, uh, the tribalism, um, and the, uh, uh, it seems that, uh, boiled down for me, uh, we're too easy to uh, look at the label and not the person. And I'll stop there. You can do that. Yeah, so what I heard you say is that you're very like worried, concerned about the current present situation politically with the dogma and um, that people aren't really listening and are just being flattened into like a word that describes like their position and not as like a human being. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, no, that, that really got it. Thank you. So, um, and, and I'm very concerned. Um, uh, you know, I see that a lot of institutions seem to be actively supporting uh, dictatorial or authoritarian regimes, uh, including the government of Israel, uh, which, uh, you know, it seems to be uh, supporting uh, President Trump, who through Steve Bannon and uh, Breitbart are the most anti-Semitic, uh, you know, uh, voices in our country. So the government of Israel is supporting anti-Semitism in the United States, and that worries me very much. So, um, you're really worried about the anti or the authoritarianism, sorry, mm -hmm. the dictatorial trends that you're seeing within institutions that have a lot of power, mm -hmm. um, including the government of Israel, mm -hmm. and that um, that government is even supporting institutions that are promoting anti-Semitism in the U.S. And Thank you, Megan. Worries you. Yeah. I've been waiting for somebody to say that for a long time besides me. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and that's why I'm involved with the empathy tent. I'm a, a special educator, a retired special education teacher. And I, my job was to look past the labels and to see the promise. And one reason I am here is because I saw the promise. We're not perfect. But there's promise there. And if as a society we pull together and we develop that promise, we can do anything. So you're talking about your experience as a special education teacher and how your job was to look past the labels and see the promise. Mm -hmm. I'm understanding of people's potential. Mm -hmm. and that you see in our society that, um, that we have that there is promise as well, and it's not perfect, but that um, you would like us to focus more on that. Um, and in order to do that, we think we need to look past the label. Great. Thank you, Mick, and I feel fully heard. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I will talk to Evan. Okay. So um, this is kind of a meta level uh, thing. Um, so I, I want to talk about this paradox that I feel where I simultaneously, this project of um, empathy circles across political divides gives me, it, it feels like one of the few things worth investing in at this point in the political context we're in. Um, and I do feel a lot of hope about it. And yet, um, I also feel afraid of empathy becoming a demand or an obligation. Um, 
because of it, it, it feels emotionally unhealthy to demand empathy or what I want is that if people are not able to empathize and are having a hard time doing that, I want understanding for why that is instead of there to be a moralistic judgment about people who are not able to access their empathy. I'll stop there for now. Yeah, um, so it sounds like you're saying how you kind of feel like you're in this paradox where you feel like the empathy circle process is, um, on one hand, it's one of the few things that you actually feel like worth it's worth investing in and it's something that gives you hope. And on the other hand, you're worried that um, that uh, there's going to be a demand for empathy where um, if somebody doesn't is not able to empathize, then that's not going to be empathized with and that there will be this moralistic judgment when someone's not able to, to give that empathy. Yes, and continuing um, with that. Um, there's different examples of where this comes up for me, but um, like something I often hear people say is applying this to like when there's an unequal power dynamic or like when somebody is just like suffering really acutely. Um, I'm trying to think of just like a simple example. Um, But I, I guess what I'm wanting is, I, I have questions, unanswered questions about the role of power dynamics in empathy and um, like, like for example, if somebody is in an abusive relationship and then if, and if, if somehow the person who is like being abused is like obligated to empathize with the person being abused, that doesn't seem good to me. Um, and obviously it's abuse is like a broad category of a variety of behaviors that we could look at with more nuance. And then multiplying that to the societal level is complicated, but I still, there's something there that I really want us to be careful about. Okay, so you're, you're saying how there's, you feel like there's this sort of unanswered territory about empathy where you're, you're not sure how, how it can work when there's an unequal power dynamic, uh, such as an abusive relationship where um, the person who's being abused is unable to empathize, you said? Um. Like if the person who's being abused is expected to empathize more than the other person. Okay, so kind, of, so kind of tying back to the the expectation. Like there's there could be an expectation for someone who's unable to empathize to empathize because of a of a process where it's being expected, um, and that the the power dynamic is is important there to to be looked at as well, um, and then it's you know, how can we apply that to a societal level and, and sort of, you know, how can we explore that nuance um, to integrate, keep integrated with empathy and keeping aligned with looking at the power dynamics? Yeah, thank you. Um, I will leave it there for now. Cool. Um, uh, let's go to Todd. Will you listen to me? Cool, cool. Um, Hmm. I guess I, I have two uh, main worries um, that are coming to me right now anyways. Uh, one is um, I something that came to mind as we were discussing it is that relationships are being hurt. Um, family relationships, uh, friendships, um, it's just saddening to me um, over politics. And I think when people are not thriving on connection, it's just harder to do everything. It's harder for society to function uh, 
and all the little things that build towards progress. Maybe I'll pause there. Yeah, thanks. So um, when you think about what you're worried about or fearful about, the thing that comes up for you is um, the extent to which familial relationships are disrupted by political disagreements and the degree to which people in their own families are having their relationships come apart because of what's going on in the political culture. And that in the absence of being able to have that connection at home, it makes it even harder for people to connect in the public discourse or with people they don't even know. Is that close to what you were saying? Yeah, quite close. Um, so as fam, not just families, but also just friendships or just mm -hmm. connections in general, whether it's coworkers, whatever it is. Um, and then I just, uh, my theory is that when you have less connection in, in society, <coughs> then you have just less energy to, to just do anything. So it's not just families, but also the relationships that build up people's everyday interactions and lives. And you see the coming out of that is that when we don't have that degree of connection, that it makes it harder to function in the world and in society and to do the things we have to do. Right, exactly. Um, trying to remember what my other worry was now. Um, yeah, I guess my other worry is, is kind of um, maybe piggybacking on a, a couple of things we've already talked about, which is um, just that it's, <clears throat> it's hard for then uh, politicians in the same vein to, to make progress on um, having a mutual goal of, of ending suffering in the world. And I, it's so hard to, how can you focus on that while you're also focused on winning, winning your side of, of the argument and, and the, the political game? So you're saying uh, another worry that you have is related to people in political office and the extent to which they're focused on winning for their side or their position or, um, you know, whatever the a particular argument may be about. They're focused on winning that rather than alleviating suffering around the world. Yeah, I feel fully heard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so everybody's had a chance to listen already, right? Yeah, yeah, and you can you don't have to go in any predetermined order. The idea is just that you know to democratize who participates. That's all. Yeah. So, uh, David, then are you good? To no, you, you should go. There's too many of us, so I'm just gonna. Okay. I'll just. Right. So choose somebody else. Well, uh, Megan, how about you? Are you good to reflect for me? Um, I wanted to respond to the thing you mentioned about power dynamics was is one of the things that came up as we've been talking and i guess it's is probably my world view that informs uh, my perspective on this which is that it's always the responsibility of those in power or of those with wealth or of those with advantage to extend that to the people that don't have them and so i'm i'm with you that it seems completely unjust to ask somebody being abused to empathize with their abuser. I'll reflect that. Um, what I'm hearing is that part of your worldview is that it's always, um, it's the responsibility of people with more power or um, in a position of wealth or influence to um, especially like over other people to extend themselves for those people who are in the less difficult position and that you um, like feel strongly that uh, it's not okay to expect someone who's being abused to empathize with their abuser. Yes, thank you for reflecting that. 
part of the I'm sorry Go ahead. okay um, part of the work I'm trying to do with empathy has to do with uh, healing racism and and as I've thought about how to do that um, it, it troubles me a bit to ask folks that have been on the receiving end of racism or sexism or whatever the ism might be that oppresses people it seems problematic for me as somebody um, with advantage in the culture that we're in, a middle-aged white guy, it seems problematic for me to even ask for empathy for my experience. And yet I'm not sure how to enter authentically into those conversations without them being mutual. Yeah, so you're facing a conundrum with your work around healing racism, um, around how to both show up authentically with what's really going on for you and also not expecting uh, somebody um, who perhaps has, is on the other side of things like um, sexism and racism as they plow into in society to empathize with your experience. Like there's like a paradox there. Yes. Thank you. One of the other things that worries me deeply, there's two pieces of it. One has to do with um, coming to a place where nobody believes anything that's said or written, right? That you, that you can't believe anything. Um, and whether that's that we refuse to or that there's legitimate question about so much deception and lying and manipulation of what's presented to us. But I'm, I'm, it gets really hard to collaborate when you can't agree on reality. So another concern that you have about kind of the current political situation is things coming to a point where nobody is trusting anything that is said or written. Um, I'm imagining like, just getting the response of like, that's fake news or um, yeah, just like zero trust in anything that, um, and it makes it really hard to collaborate if you can't agree on what's real. Yes. And the, the final thing I'll share is in the, in the, and this is sort of when I try to, try to touch what makes me afraid about all this. It's got to do with that, that somebody in power will at one point decide to take a unilateral action that is designed to eliminate all that oppose them. So this is a common like trope in science fiction. And there's a, there's a book called Wool by a guy named Hugh Howie that, that is a scenario kind of like this and it's frightening. So another fear that you have is that somebody with a lot of power will take a unilateral action to eliminate um, everyone who opposes them and this is like a trope you've seen in science fiction and like I'm kind of speculating that you can imagine it happening in the world and, and it scares you. Yes. Thank you. I feel fully heard. Okay. Um, I will talk to, do you go by Bill or William? Bill's fine. Okay. I'll talk to Bill. Sure. I'm listening. Um, what do I want to say? Um, so kind of continuing with that, that thread that, um, Todd picked back up that I had raised, um, I just want to talk more about why it does feel so paradoxical to me. And because at the same time that I'm worried about people in a position of less power who are possibly I'm, I'm worried about empathy being weaponized and um, 
I mean, it already is sometimes, like, um, it already is weaponized. I think the way that rationality is weaponized, um, where people will say, oh, you just have to think rationally, like, don't be so emotional when, like, the fact is that we are emotional creatures, and I don't think we can ever not be emotional creatures. I'm kind of getting off track, but just as I'm afraid of people who are in a position of less power being sort of demanded to empathize and be legitimized if they don't, I'm also worried about categories of of who is the abuser and who is the abusee being um, oversimplified or concretized in ways that just escalate the situation. Um, so to, to try to make this more concrete, I would like to give an example of like, I think in the activist tradition that I spent a lot of my formative years in, um, for example, like CEOs of big companies that are doing environmental damage or anybody working for those companies would just be seen as the enemy, the abuser, you know, the person who's abusing the planet. Mm -hmm. And yet I also have the idea that people in those positions, people, legislators making decisions, even that are hurting people, I think that they still need empathy. And um, I'm afraid we do this reflect what I said so far. I'm feeling a little lost and confused. About yeah, that. right. Well, I was going to suggest maybe I can do a reflection and it can help you. Yeah. So, um, so in one sense, I hear your, um, your concern that empathy is such as rationalism be weaponized, such as the empathy police. So whenever, I mean, and, with, and this is a phenomenon. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting off here. Okay. So the empathy police which is a, uh, is a phenomenon that happens when any group forms to establish a hierarchy. So in other words, what I feel in your concern about that, the empathy police, is the forming of a hierarchy rather than dealing with empathy directly in, in its pure form. Is, is that right? Um, I guess the forming of a hierarchy in terms of like I was talking about before, like, oh, the more empathic someone is, the better of a person they are. Right. Instead of recognizing that, oh, people are more empathic when their their nervous systems are more regulated, and our nervous systems are more regulated when we have our basic needs met. <laughs> you know. Right. Like it's not a like it's not like you're a bad person if you're not empathizing. Right. So you're saying <laughs> that if you're not um, you're not in full guru mood at all times, uh, there are times where people will then criticize you for being emotional or having like a human. Uh, thought or things like that. And that's what you don't want to see empathy being used as, as a cudgel, yeah. as a hierarchical cudgel. Yeah. yeah. And then the other part is in, um, is in, uh, in power dynamics or abusive situations where you're concerned that then if empathy as is misunderstood is then used as sort of like with the abuser is feels forced, which in, then would perpetuate the abuse to quote unquote, empathize with the uh, abuser. Well, I'm sorry, I hope I said that right. The abused is forced to empathize with the abuser and you find that that's not empathy and that's a concern to you. Yeah, um, but then the last part that I was adding is almost like the opposite. It's like the other half of the paradox where I also mm -hmm. worry that especially within certain activist circles that I have been a part of, mm -hmm. that our ideas about who the abuser are and who the abusee is get too concretized. And, and people, it's actually like the concept of abuser is just another label that dehumanizes somebody. Okay, so then you're also saying that even within the left, that you're concerned that uh, even the CEOs and the corporations are painted with a broad brush and just seen as villains and not seen for the individuals they are as well. Um, yeah, or like, I mean, even, I'm not 
sure there's something, but I'm not sure how I'm on time. So time is up now. Okay. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Um, I'm so confused about how exactly to express my concerns about this. Hopefully, maybe in another round or two, it'll get clear. Thank you. Be happy to try. Yeah. Be happy to try. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Todd. I'll sp oh, Todd is uh, Evan. Well, we'll go with Evan just to. Uh, you have to rest up, Todd, I think. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Evan, would you listen to me, please? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was very, very touched by what Megan said about uh, abusive relationships, because in my job, that's exactly, I dealt with all sorts of abusive relationships. And what I found is that empathy, properly practiced and understood, is not used as a cudgel. And when the abused empathizes with the abuser, they don't accept the abuser's worldview, but they come to understand the weaknesses and foibles that cause the abuser. Because when you're abusing someone, you feel a lack. And so you have to get it from somebody else. And so in my work with empathy, the, abuse, the abused starts to understand that the flaws and the weaknesses of the abuser and so therefore begins to free themselves. Yeah, so you were touched by what Megan said about abusive relationships because you yourself were working with a lot of abusive relationships in your work. Mm -hmm. And um, when empathy is used properly in your experience, it's, it's not used as a cudgel. It um, it's, sounds like a mutual process uh, that maybe is consented to, I imagine, um, for both parties where it's not about um, part, part of the, the abuse, abused empathizing with the abuser is not about accepting their worldview, but just coming to an understanding of their weaknesses or foibles, as you mentioned, um, to sort of free themselves from maybe, maybe the torment. Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. The, thank you. Um, the uh, the abuser uh, the abuser is no longer this monster, but is humanized and therefore no longer needs to be feared in the same way. Um, and um, and and I agree with Megan. I think that uh, we in the empathy circle, uh, like for instance, the image that like that you had was sort of like the. The same room and process like we're going through now, and that's not necessarily appropriate um, to do. Uh, but when the abuser or the abused then starts to empathize or just live in the in the uh, shoes of the abused a bit, even removed, not having to you know be with them or anything like that, they understand that they are just weak, and again, that starts to you know start their healing process. So I'll stop there. So you're saying how um, it's it's not even where the two people have to be in the same room. It could be just talking to the abuser, putting and helping them get into the shoes of the person that they abused, mm -hmm. and just seeing that it's it's a weakness, um, and just being able to heal from there. Right. That and that of empathy is beyond the empathy circle. Um, and uh, there's one more thing quick. Um, uh, I don't have it right now, so I'll, I'll end there. Thanks. Okay, so I guess just to reflect back the last thing, um, just that empathy goes beyond, you know, this process, you know, like an empathy circle. And, oh, I think I missed what you said in the beginning, which was that, um, you know, an, em an empathy circle or, or any structured process like that might not, it's, it's just an option, but it, it's not necessarily what you might apply to a certain situation, if it, especially if it's abusive. Okay. Thanks, Evan. I feel hurt, fully heard. Thank you. Cool, no worries. Um, I'll pass the torch back to Lewis. Okay, I am present. Cool. Um, yeah, the, uh, the concern about empathy certainly brings up a lot of feelings for me. Um, 
in a yeah it it would be so sad for me if i witnessed a process where um empathy was demanded from someone i think that's that seems sort of um so such an oxymoron <laughs> i i hear and feel that you're um concerned more personally about how empathy could be you abused <laughs> the demand for empathy could be abused and that what an oxymoron that is and right and when i when i picture people that do empathy work um the people that i meet in 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 my uh per perception they're such uh mostly gentle souls very sensitive souls so whenever i picture an empathy process starting in any situation it's very it's very slow and gentle and what are you okay with and you know there's a lot of preparation and um yeah it's it's almost hard for me to picture somebody who who is uh, uh a supported empathy worker you know somehow missing that fundamental piece that there's no demands in this process yeah <clears throat> interesting so i hear that your experience so far is that everybody practicing empathy comes from a soft open soul position um and that therefore this concept that uh that there are some who would abuse the process um um is disturbing to you to imagine it yeah um and i th and i also understand that it's hard for people um i can under totally understand how it's hard for people to um drop labels going into it um, um but i know that um just from my personal use of this kind of empathy work and at least in my my own relationships in life because that's where i can practice it um it's been it's been wonderful and um when there's when there's mutual um, energy about it, um, and when there's no demands being made, and um, yeah, it it kind of I I feel like it it takes care of power dynamics on its own just by trusting the process, and um, maybe I'll pause there. Yeah, no, it's. <clears throat> Because uh, what I hear is that because your experience is that both you and others with whom you practice empathy in your personal life are, are able to do it from openness and trying to understand one another and feeling seen and heard and understood by one another that it's, to go back to what you started with, it's almost hard for you to imagine that when empathy is used to, uh, to um, put labels on it and to, to get involved in power dynamic, using it as a practice of power over others is, is hard for you to imagine because it's not one you experience. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add one, one last thing here, which is that um, um, for me, for my, for, my practice of, of this work, um, kicking and screaming and shouting. Um, and you know, that's all part of it. That's all. And forgiving that forgiving human emotions is all part of it. That's one of the best parts I think is, um, under, you know, coming to a mutual understanding that yes, raw expression and you can't be have a perfect, you know, hundred percent empathy all the time. <laughs> Yeah, so I hear that you even experience that the empathy process enables you and others with whom you're doing it to feel okay about having emotions and passion and even anger or whatever, and that that's part of, of an authentic expression that therefore ought to be um, allowed and be comfortable for one another. Yeah, thank you. I feel fully heard. <laughs> Okay. You know, I actually would like to participate because I have some ideas of what we're sort of grappling with. So maybe if you would talk to me, Lewis, 
and I could jump in. Great. Okay. Um, so my, uh, even though I'm talking to you, not to Megan, in a way, I really wanted to be heard how incredibly grateful I am that Megan has expressed what she's expressed. Because in this conversation that otherwise was going to be only about politics, all of these things that we are discussing certainly could be applied to just political relationships. However, I think it is so valuable as we're learning through Me Too and, and how women have felt and how others have felt uh, been subjected to racism and all the versions of power over that uh, we really, empathy really needs to be much more with those who are victims of all forms of abuse, whether it be power abuse or sexual abuse or political righteousness or anything. So I, I love the emotional feeling level that Megan has brought to this instead of just an intellectual discussion about political differences. I really thank you, Megan. You're very appreciative of uh, the concerns that M Megan raised about having this core value of empathy being used to perpetuate the power of people in power and uh, you feel that I'm not sure I got the other part of it actually I got to somehow I'm that's okay it's the essence of it it's as if I said it in two or three ways I'm just uh, because in addition to the gift that those of us have to be able to be empathetic and hear each other's perspectives whether in politics or in relationships as Evan said so well it's like Wow, you mean sometimes this can be highly abused, uh, which is what Megan brings up, and for that I'm really grateful. Right. So she, she, you're grateful that that Megan is is bringing up the is emphasizing how important it is to listen to people <clears throat> who have been in, abused, and that from your perspective they have they're more deserving, they need extra listening. Um, that's what I thought you said before, actually, I realized, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And in fact, it's, her description of it is so personal. He, she had not shared details, but we can fe I can feel that it's so personal that I really, that brings my personal experiences. I happen to have a daughter who's 36 and bipolar and schizoaffective. And so in two ways, uh, I have learned from the way she has felt abused with any lack of empathy, because of lack of empathy, lack of understanding for what it feels like to be bipolar and to be schizoaffective. On, on one hand, not to be able to have the balance that others have in their emotions, and yet, on the other hand, ironically, she has an increased sensitivity and, and beyond the normal, which therefore prevents her from feeling or acting normal. And for me to have learned from her and to be empathetic about what that must feel like, since I, in my very balanced chemistry, don't have a clue for what that can feel like, it's, it's, she's been my greatest teacher, and I'm really touched, therefore, by Megan bringing this up. So you, 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 were, you were really feeling echo all the reason. Is anybody else hearing that? Maybe I need no. To... Okay. You were feeling, you were really feeling what the deep emotion when Megan was speaking, that she was telling you something that she was feeling strongly herself and you were also feeling because you have a daughter who, uh, has been abused because of who she is and who is not seen for who she is in some sense. Exactly. And in addition to that, even if she wasn't bipolar schizoaffective, although chicken and egg are both true here, she has also been sexually abused and raped uh, and um, uh, beaten physically by 
again, chicken and egg, because as a bipolar schizoaffective, she did use drugs to medicate her mental illness, as she describes it, and therefore got involved in, in, a, in a community that was highly abusive. Um, so go ahead, summarize that. Then I'll have one closing thing. Okay, so uh, your daughter's experience, uh, you said chicken and egg, I guess you're saying she's not totally at faultless. She, she, she participated in an environment. She was a willing, because of her weaknesses, she was a willing participant in an environment where she ended up being abused. Right. And so... Um, so given all that has been said and shared by all of us, um, I, um, I, I, I love this graphic of a triangle. So in a way, forgive me, but it says it all for me that if you can see this, that to maximize, to maximize trust and empathy and intimacy in any relationship, whether it be business or political or with our best lover or our daughter or our friend or whomever, ideally we will have zero power over or under one another and zero sexual energy over or under one another and that and that with relationships that involve power over one another which means the other is experiencing power under that's abuse and that when sex isn't sensually and lovingly mutual any sexual energy is also a power, an invasion over, and the victim experiences it. And so to truly have empathy about anyone in that position of being victimized by power or sex over, we need, we need to have much more empathy for that and really hear and understand how any of us might be even unintentional perpetrators, okay? With best intention, we need to hear the impact of our words and our actions on others. Um, way before, just to end this circle that she so cleverly drew for us, way before we expect them to have empathy for us and how we could be so misguided. So, okay. So you're in, an, in, your, in an idealized world, um, we would be sensitive enough to understand um, when we are doing things that involve power over, we would be sensitive to how our actions are affecting, our, what are the results of, what are, what, is, what are the feelings that our actions are e e e evoking in the other person we would we would be aware of that so that our actions are our words our behavior is mutually supportive exactly and in fact to, to well, you know, so your, your time is up now okay great um thank I mean, you we have to do that otherwise we don't get it no of course yeah. of course i feel you very can. heard thank you for listening okay so i'll speak to todd um the reason I wanted to speak actually was to actually bring it back to politics um, because I think there's another word that's not being used here and that's listening actually. You know, it's one thing to empathize, that's a deeper form of listening, but, but you know, I th my feeling is that one of the primary things that is happening and it's very related to what Megan is talking about is the community, you know, this, the identity politics movement, which started is in the feminist world is my sense, you know, and came out of this French philosophy is that every, every interaction is a power dynamic. I'll stop with that. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is that when we focus our attention back on the political realm and political discourse, that there's something about listening that you want to dig into a little deeper. And it's connected to 
the sense that uh, we're viewing every interaction as uh, embedded with or carrying some kind of power dynamic. Right, and I think what happened, what's happened is my, my sense of what's happened is women, you know, uh, minorities, whether they're, you know, LGBTQ or racial minorities, you know, are sick and tired, have gotten sick of tired of not being heard, basically. And, 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 you know, there was a political thought process, which is, you know, you know, we've tried, you're not listening. We're not going to listen to you anymore. You know, and that's how this whole hierarchy of privilege has been created where, you know, if I'm a gay, if I'm a, if I'm a lesbian black woman, you know, my, I'm, I'm high up or higher up on the hierarchy than you, a, you know, white middle-class male. So I don't have to listen to you because you're privileged and, you know, it's my turn, basically. I feel like that's something that's happening now. So you think you're saying that the outcome of um, identity politics and the French philosophy that you alluded to is this um, ranking of privilege where folks that have historically been excluded from dialogue have, uh, or from having their voices heard even, have um, achieved a critical mass in which they are saying that anybody who is not in that um, collection of identity groups is uh, that they're just not going to listen to the other. Right. I mean, I, I know I'm not saying this clearly enough. So I think there's been a reaction by minorities and oppressed people to not being heard. And they have appropriated power by saying, we don't have to listen to you anymore. We've tried to get you to hear us. And then the backlash, which is what Trump is, you know, taking, has taken advantage of is, you know, white men feeling like, you know, wait a minute, I'm not the one who did this stuff, actually. I'm not a racist. So if you won't listen to me, I'm not going to listen to you. And that's, I think, a little bit of where Megan is starting to come from, whereas here you have the, you know, the privileged power group saying, you know, wait a minute, what about me? You know, I, I'm not, I'm actually, I might look like I'm privileged, but I'm not privileged. I come from, you know, a trailer park or whatever it is that they're excuses. Uh, so where we, we're starting to have two groups of, e of people who are not listening to each other anymore. And that's, you know, and, 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 and some of these people are manipulating this fact that people aren't listening to each other and using that as, a, you know, they're not using the word empathy, but it's that, it's coming out of that, that they, you know, that they're, they're not being listened to and they're reacting that to this group of people who wants to take power for them and doesn't want to listen to them by not listening. You know, so it's mutual not listening um, is where we're getting to systemically, you know. I'm sorry it's not clear, but. So let me try to, try to reflect that. I, I think I get what you're saying. Um, here's what I'm hearing, that you observe an escalating level of not listening. And you see that various groups in their delineation of who's in and out of their group declare the out from their group not worthy of being heard. Right. And, and it's, yeah, go ahead. And that the, the more groups of people we have doing it, the less listening is ever actually happening. Right. And I just, the, the last point is, and it becomes pure power dynamics. And yeah. So the, you don't the only, like that. Yeah. okay. Yep. Go ahead. I feel heard. Thank you. Yeah.
trying to gather my thoughts of that because there was something fairly stimulating in there and I haven't uh, been able to put my finger on exactly what it was. Um, William, Bill, are you ready for a turn? Sure. Okay, um, yes. Yeah, thanks. So, I guess what's alive for me as I hear that is that as I've pursued connection with people who are different from me, they have been accepting of my efforts to engage with them empathetically and to listen. Okay. So you're experiencing um, basically seeking out uh, and interacting with people that are different than you is that they've been very appreciative and accepting of your empathetic uh, attempts to, uh, you know, bridge the divide, to communicate, to do whatever. Yeah. And kind of going back to uh, the thing I was saying earlier about how I feel a responsibility based on the privilege and advantage I've been given by the society I was born into mm -hmm. to do my part in bridging that othering. Okay. So, um, acknowledging the relative privilege that you were born into, you feel um, a duty and an obligation to, um, to bridge that divide between those who are not as fortunate and yourself. Yeah. Do. Yeah. And so as I've encountered folks who have been angry about the way they're treated in the world we live in, and I've, approached them with the spirit of while wow, I'd be angry if I'd been treated that way too, even in cases where they don't want to listen to me, I've found ways to be okay with that. Okay. So um, even reaching out to people who are not necessarily receptive to your overtures, you found that you don't take that personally. And you find that as, as part of a, rather than taking it as a personal affront, you take it as a learning experience, a growth experience. I think that's a, that's a piece of it. That's a piece of learning and growth is a piece of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think what the bigger piece though, is just the conviction that I, I'd, I'd be that angry too. So the bigger part of it, I guess, rather than uh, the acceptance of what they're doing, is your deepening of an understanding of their personal experience and the anger and the hurt and the sadness behind it. Yeah, I think, I think that's what I was trying to get to. And um, I've spoken very slowly because all of this is pretty half-baked in my head. Um, okay. So I've been just trying to, to, to get a connection to um, the emotion that arose out of uh, what David shared. Okay. So you were triggered by the emotion out of what David shared. And uh, so you are uh, scrambling to both think and then express yourself at the same time. So, so you slowed it down a bit. Yeah. So thanks for your patience with that. I feel hard. My pleasure with that. Uh, um, Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, all right. All right. Uh, all right. We're back. Um, Evan. Okay. Um, huh. Well, uh, I want to uh, also endorse what uh, Lewis said as far as Megan bringing up uh, you know, emotional and uh, part of it, and also the issue, which I feel very strong of about, 
which is uh, developing a hierarchy. Um, and, you know, whatever the movement is, you know, uh, I studied, you know, 15 years with the Grand Master. Uh, somebody's going to come along and sit, tell you, oh, yeah, well, I dated him in utero. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, it's, and that's all about creating a hierarchy and not about getting the job done. Um, and so I hope that this uh, healthy skepticism of uh, group hierarchies continues, uh, hopefully deflected through humor and understanding and uh, acceptance. I'll stop there. Yeah, so you, uh, you wanted to <clears throat> start by endorsing uh, what Megan was saying about bringing up the importance of emotion, or I guess rather the importance of um, accepting emotion, being accepting of emotions. Um, and then also bring up how uh, hierarchy, again, is problematic because it's basically a competition about who knows more about the topic or who studied more. Um, and it's not about getting the job done. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, sorry, maybe you can repeat the last part about, um, what was it about deflecting humor as a, as a way oh. to... Hopefully, yeah. I mean, uh, then to take, um, you know, both Megan's view about, you know, she's actually seen the demonization of the other, whether it be a CEO or something like that, that the way this is done is through um, humor and kindness and acceptance. So the, uh, the way to avoid the dehumaniz dehumanization of a CEO or, or whoever is uh, through humor and, and acceptance. Yeah, so when our own inner CEOs come out, in all of us, even if we're not, yeah. Um, um, and I wanna then, I guess, just kind of put in a plug for this process um, because it's not just the process, it's the individuals and what the individuals bring to it. So then you're learning a very simple process. But a lot of the stuff that comes out of it um, is, uh, is the unique contribution of the individuals. So that's why, I, while not perfect, uh, I find that the process is uh, very robust. Okay, so you're saying it's not just about the process, it's about what the individuals bring to it. And um, usually the, the process, while it might not be perfect, it, it's usually robust enough to have a really important effect. Right, because it's, it's not just the process, it's also what the individuals. And that what Megan, you know, was the subject, we sort of went there, and that triggered something in us. And there was freedom to do that. And that's what's really good about the process. Okay. I think it broke up a little bit there, but I, th I think you were saying how um, uh, what Megan brought up sort of triggered something emotional in the participants here and, and that, that how great that is that we have a process where we can express and react. Excellent. Even with the breakup, I feel fully heard. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Cool. Um, I'll select uh, Megan. Um, um, hmm. I feel like I'm running out of thoughts here. Hmm. Maybe I'll take a few seconds of my time just to see if there's anything, anything else. Um, thoughts and wait a few seconds. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess, um, I feel like part of the reason why labels are never constructive, um, or that's a theory that I have is that labels are never constructive, um, is, uh, because people often get defensive and also because it's, it's not really, it's a, it's a floaty idea that you can't prove, um, you can't like take a little radar that says that measures power on someone and say, no, really look at it. We, we can all agree on this now. It's something that can be argued over for, for days and days and days. So it's just, I find it's more constructive to just put labels aside and 
like focus on people's needs and making sure everyone's happy and going as slow as possible as, as it takes to, until everyone's as happy as possible. Yeah, so I'm hearing you say that you really don't find it to be a productive use of time to focus on labels or even like um, trying to establish who is more powerful in a situation because there's no way to really measure it. Like you can't just run a radar over someone and it'll say like measure their power in a given situation. And it can just be a really energy drain and suck up time arguing over that. And so you gotta focus on the needs and like going slowly and trying to find a way to meet all the needs. Yeah, and then I think the only piece there was that was just um, people often get defensive when they're labeled. So that just makes it almost oh, impossible yeah. usually to get anywhere in my experience. Oh yeah, so like um, another reason why labels seem counterproductive to you is that then people want to argue about whether or not they fit the label rather than spending that time trying to meet needs. Yeah, actually, I guess I will add one more piece to that. Um, and then when people get defensive, then people say you're not allowed to be defensive or or you're fragile. Um, and then it's like, yeah, it just it just keep it can keep piling on and going back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then there's like, I'm I'm guessing that like how I'm understanding it is that then that's another layer. It's like adding layers of uh, obstacles between actually getting to the heart of the issue. But that other layer is people saying you're not allowed to get defensive. And so you'd rather just kind of nip it in the bud uh, with the labels. Like if, if people are going to say you're not allowed to get offensive and someone does get defensive and labels cause people to get defensive, then just kind of avoid the labels in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, I feel fully heard. So, so look, I just want to say that this is going to be the last round before Edwin sucks us back into, into the main capsule. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will, I will speak to Lewis. Okay. I can hear you. One thing that I've been kind of worried about through my participation in this is just if I'm being too abstract or like not grounding what I'm saying in examples and then it's like might get mis be more likely to be misunderstood or might not be as productive um, and so I'd like to just give an example um, can before you give an example can I can I say that what I hear is that you feel when you try to express yeah. yourself it might be perceived of as being too intellectual too pedantic to conceptual and um, and therefore not be received and so you'd like to give an example is that accurate yeah i just want to ground it in like real human experience um so an example of again uh this is a paradox and this is kind of one side of the paradox is um a while back on my facebook account um someone i know um, I don't know if you all know what it's like <laughs> kind of inside like social networks like um, anyway uh, certain certain subcultures on social networks um, there was this hashtag that got popular which was hashtag men are trash and um, somebody I know not very well uh, posted that and she was like oh, if anybody wants to tell me this hashtag isn't okay, then I'm going to block you from being my friend. And I felt very uncomfortable with that. And, um, like, I get, I get where she's coming from. Like, and she explained it in this very overly intellectualized way about, um, oh, like, you know, like, so many women have so many bad experiences in relationships with men and that this, like this expression basically is just a, is a way to vent and prioritizing 
letting um, letting people who are suffering, like venting, um, without having to speak in any certain way. And I get that, but I also felt very uncomfortable with it because it's kind of like justifying abuse. And it, like it is emotional abuse to say that somebody is trash, and and then people will justify it by saying, oh well, that's but that's not nearly as bad as somebody like you know like killing their partner, which happens way more often towards women from what I know. Um, and it's not, but that doesn't mean that it's okay either um, or that it is helping build a world that like is going to be good for all of us. Um, and so I, I did start to dialogue with her about it and tell her what I felt. Okay. So to try to summarize um, that on Facebook, one example is that you've experienced that there was a friend who stated a hashtag that men are trash and that if anybody doesn't like that and responds negatively to that, she'll block them. And that um, you, 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 you don't approve either of the label that all men are trash, so you don't think what she's saying is appropriate, and to block others who feel differently is not appropriate, and you're just uncomfortable with the whole process. And it's a great example of, of what we all started with, which is when, when there's no empathy at all, or when you're demanding to be so understood that anybody who doesn't agree with you is blocked, that's the opposite of empathy. So did, did that summarize what you're saying well enough, even though I chose some different words? Um, I guess I just, I had really mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I see, okay, if somebody is expressing themselves in this really violent way, like she must be suffering herself. On the other hand, I don't want to condone what feels to me like just the perpetuation of um, right. more violence right. in the world, even if it's just like verbal violence. Yeah, thank you. So the part I didn't reflect well enough, and now I believe I hear, is that you agree with her emotion that if she's been treated that way by men, of course she might feel that way. And yet, by then blocking everybody who doesn't agree with her, it, um, it, it, it becomes just as bad as, it's just as abusive in a way as, as she has experienced. And therefore, you're uncomfortable, even though you agree with how she feels, you don't agree with how she's acting. Is that close? One minute, um, one minute until we are sucked in. Because <laughs> okay. you have exactly, such a but, but you see belts on. Maybe, maybe we'll have a chance to look at it in the future again. Okay. So I at least feel that here that you have a lot of empathy for how she feels and you feel the conflict between feeling that way and how you express it. And that I'm not necessarily. I wanna, yeah, I don't want to condone. You don't want to condone her expression of that, even though you appreciate how she feels. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Thank all of you. Thank you very much, everybody. I don't know exactly the moment he's going to do it, but he warned me. <laughs> right now. I think we just got to where I was, what I was trying to say, which is, here we go. It's the replacement, this not listening to the, to the first, to the perpetrators, is just replacing who's in the position of being in power, basically, you know. All right, I guess we should click this button then. Yes. Yeah.
perhaps we can get an offline conversation going sometime. Absolutely. Cool. Hi, everybody. Hey. I love when Empathy Circles creates new friendships. <laughs> I, that's exactly what I'm feeling right here. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And JJ, it's really a pleasure to meet you too, my friend. Right back at you. Right on, man. It was good conversations. Yes. Yeah, so it's amazing. Is everybody, is everybody back? I think everybody's here, right? Am I forgetting? So Bob never really got back? Uh, no. Okay. So to wrap up, uh, we'd love to hear from everybody. If you can keep it short, um, one or two sentences about what was uh, the thing that was the most helpful or that you learned today about the empathy circle. And um, I'm going to name when from the way I see it in my screen. So I'm going to start with Nilang. Nilang. Oh, let me, me Okay. Yeah, it was a great experience. And one of the best things that I actually learned is identity politics and how we need to be inclusive of all, including the, the white population, the white citizens in our country. And, um, and um, we cannot tend to just focus on minority. We have to be inclusive of all if we want to create a true, genuine uh, culture of empathy for all. So that's what I learned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nilang. Uh, JJ? I learned that people that are different than me still have great intentions. And, and everyone just really wants the best for everybody. We just have different ways of doing it. Nice. Thank you, JJ. Art? Thank you. Um, so um, I, I, you know, I always love these empathy circles uh, because you know the way it, it you know opens up communication. And I just want to say that I, I really, really value having someone who has completely different views from me. Uh, and today that would be you, JJ. And I really appreciate you being here because this is where it really starts to to make things happen when we can you know really try to understand someone who completely has a different point of view. And and like JJ said, understand that there's more similarity than difference in there. Mm. So, thank sure. you. Uh, Edwin? Uh, yeah, I always love empathy circles. I really think that these can uh, change the world, you know, that we can really, you know, scale these up. Uh, if we can talk among each other, we can scale it up to the politicians, to the pundits, to the powers that be you came up about the, the wealthy, the, the elites. I think we need to bring them into empathy circles too. So, I, I really see what we're modeling here as a way forward for the society. All right, thank you, Edwin. Uh, Lewis? So, so, as always, I appreciate sort of what Art and JJ said, the diversity just being heard and understood. And yet today, especially, I appreciated that Megan uh, brought up a more personal experiences about empathy and when it can even be abused. And it's not just about the politics, it's about very personal dynamics, and I appreciated that. Uh, Bill, if you can unmute yourself, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I've, as my experience in the past, I had a, uh, a great uh, deep uh, connection um, in the empathy circle. Uh, I agree we talked about uh, the politics of empathy circles in a way. Um, and uh, you know, and so I really appreciated it. Um, and I really appreciated everybody there. Uh, and it uh, gives me hope that when you really talk to hu you know, other humans, that you see that uh, we have a lot more in common than we have differently and there are ways forward. And uh, as long as we're talking, we'll figure it out. <laughs> nice quote in the end. As long as we're talking, we'll figure it out. That's <laughs> nice. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Todd? Yeah, so this was my second empathy circle. And uh, the one I participated in last time, everybody just took one turn. And so the thing that was different about this one was since we had more time available, um, we basically wove this fabric of conversation that allowed us to go really deep, I think, um, in our thinking and in our, in our conversation. And so I'm grateful for um, kind of the spaciousness of uh, time that allowed for a spaciousness of thought 
um, and depth of thought. Um, yeah, so thanks. Mm, thank you, Tim. Dave? Yeah, so I, uh, I guess following up on what Todd just said, I, I mean, I've done many of these, and what I'm starting, what's really nice about the process is you kind of drop into this space of collective, when you get to places where people's ideas are not clearly formulated, you drop into this sort of collective space of sort of negotiating the boundaries of the uh, of your ideas that you haven't formulated together and that's a really nice feeling so uh, you know i think it's a you know what i've been telling people is it's an unusual form of conversation that leads to different kinds of places than you usually get to and the last thing i want to say is to jj who i didn't get this to, to to have anything to do with is we need more people from the right. If you have friends, bring them along. <laughs> Please. I will do. Evan? Yeah, I appreciate everything everyone said so far. And um, maybe I'll just add that I'm also glad it's just a place where people can come to express their ideas. And maybe some of you feel like you haven't had a chance to express these ideas in your circles, and especially with how heated things are getting. And that's why we're here. So. Um, yeah, just appreciate that as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Megan, I don't know if you, if we can hear you, if you typed on the chat. No, I think that you can. Um, I think what I appreciate right now is being able to share ideas that I don't necessarily we have 100% um, articulated and that not being like used against me which so often happens in political conversation but if you can't like you know if your ideas aren't all laid out super clear then you're just written off kind of instead of it being more like collaborative like let's all kind of try to figure this out together even if we're not exactly sure how to say it how to express them mm -hmm. Were you able to hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'll finish it up. Uh, it was so great to hear everybody's, um, what was the, the, thing the thing they appreciated about Empathy Circle. And for me, I learned like, you learn, like identity politics. And so I'm going to jump on Google right after and do my research on that. <laughs> and I love learning that. And, and also I loved that how I could notice how um, at some point I felt really hot, like I was a bit stressed to share an idea. And I was like, no, I'm safe in this empathy circle. And I was able to share what I had to say and felt heard. And I felt my body relaxed. And I think that's one of the beauty of empathy circle. It's like, it is a safe place. And we need more space like that, more safe place, because um, this is how I think we're going to be like Bill said, like being able to talk to each other to, you know, come up with solutions to make a to make a world better. So um, thank you so much for everybody coming on, on two hours on the Saturday. Um, it was really great to, to meet you all and I'm hoping that we're gonna, we are gonna do more and I think there's way more Empathy Circle coming up. So yeah. Every Saturday. <laughs> Every Saturday, wow, yeah. <laughs> and plus more. <laughs> all right, well, we can wrap it up here. Thank you okay. so much, well, guys. Thanks for facilitating, Jessica. <laughs> and everyone else in the other group too, Lewis and David for hosting the other group. Yeah, take Thank care everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. On you. Well, that was fun. I had a good yeah, time. Yeah, just debrief. Yeah. JJ, on, if you want to leave the group, it's on your bottom right. It says leave meeting if you can see the place. You can see that. You can hang out if you want to. Oh, so also. <laughs> I think we're going to just debrief a little bit. I thought, I mean, it went really well. It was fun. We heard this. Okay, if I record it. Just kind of facilitators uh, debrief. How, how'd it go in your group? Uh, it was good. You know, Megan brought up uh, 
a subject that became the focus of the of what we talked about, which was she feels there's a par you know she doesn't know what to do with this paradox you know how do you, i'll simplify it but how do you empathize with a neo-nazi i mean that wasn't the term <clears throat> that she used but you know how how do you you know what you know she doesn't want you know this idea that we need to demand empathy she feels like is complicated because you know you know can you demand that victims empathize with their abusers was was the way she sort of started that and that led into a whole Mm. discussion you know that was people felt quite you know it was not political it was more mm -hmm. sort of personal so it was good it was good and i tried to steer it back a bit to politics yeah. it's all related. but it was a you know as usual it was it was good yeah. were you able to take part because it was you no know, if you were gonna take yeah part, i only i only i i started it and then I, <clears throat> one other, I said, look, I have something I'd like to say if somebody would speak to me. And that's all I did. And everybody had two or th three turns. They had three turns each, I think. How did yours go? I think it was a good uh, balance. Like everybody <clears throat> gets to like three or four turns. It felt like, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm good at remembering those things, but it felt really go a good balance. Um, and we had very different topics, actually. Like a lot of different things pop up for everybody. And um, I found JJ was great, like for his first time doing it. Like, I'm always amazed, like even uh, the, the other empathy circle I facilitated like a few weeks ago or last week, I don't remember. Same thing, the woman was, was her first time and she was amazing. And I was like, wow, like it, it, it is easy for people to pick it up if they've seen a bit of the videos and stuff. And uh, it gives me hope that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to take lots of training to get you started and then there's deeper that we can go so i and i really enjoy learning stuff honestly um and yeah definitely i want more people with more various opinion and i'm wondering though if it takes few times uh, I'm, I'm curious to know if as an experiment if there's if a group stays the same group if things can actually go deeper and deeper because i still feel that especially in the first time people are still very nice to each other yeah so much for sharing oh my god and, I <laughs> with person. and i'm wondering if you know being empathetic is not being nice necessarily it's not agreeing or whatever so i'd like to see if we keep uh this as one group where people who really really disagree can actually go deeper and not just being nice to each other i'm curious to know how it would mm -hmm. be I mean, I, I sort of think that, you know, partly this is, people are self-selecting to do this. Yeah. You know, so they want to, they want to listen and they want to do this. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't see why we can't really disagree and still be nice. It's, it's, it's not that we can have both. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like you're wondering like, yeah, we're, we're, well, it's, it's okay to be nice. Like we don't have to <laughs> disagree and be mean. Um, what I'm saying is like the circles I've been with people who didn't know each other, I found I was more niceness. And, and I'm wondering if that might prevent us to really go in, in a really disagreement more. Yeah, sometimes people avoid a, a real emotional disagreement and, and to begin yeah. with. And after a group stays together for a couple hours, all the things that piss you off about other people start arising. Yeah. And then it starts getting much uh, more deep, more deep, more deep, it becomes deeper. Yeah. yeah. Because there's about an hour, the first hour is just kind of getting used to the whole process. And then we start sinking in. And then there's going to be like levels to getting, you know, really deep but it could be if there's two people from the left and right like these the saturday group is just an open group and anyone can keep coming to have that ongoing group like you're talking about but then i think also to have the other circles where we bring two more contentious people together too is another structure well, and i'm wondering if that could help um like dave mentioning that megan brought up a very specific topic and I think that might be um, something we can try about the topics 
instead of having a more like you concerned about the political situation, which is very big and vague, maybe having specific question of like what people are actually asking themselves about, like Megan asking, wow, how do you empathize with someone you, <coughs> that hurt you? That's something a lot of people ask themselves. And I'm wondering if having topics that are a bit more uh, question that people would ask themselves and specific could yeah. bring, could bring more people with disagreements and I've stuff. been really struggling with that like about the whole topics area because yeah. that's the whole field that how the topics are framed has a lot to do and what is the best topics for what situation so I was for setting up the next two meetings I was uh, Saturdays I was thinking of uh, the one bridging the divide just because it's Christmas the holidays I would be sort of positive <laughs> not get into the but then in the new year, you know, maybe what, what angers you about politics or something where there's more of a contention about it? I'm not really sure. I don't have a real visceral sense yet. Of but in a way, that question that, you know, how do you empathize? You, you can, it can be your abusers or how do you empathize with ah, people on uh -huh. the other side? How do you empathize with people who you have strong disagreements with? Yeah. How do you, yeah, you know, who you think... Question. You know, because in our environment, you know, we've kind of, we start to think of the other side as evil. You know, how do you empathize with the, with the other? Some version of that question is in a sense central. But I was also thinking that, you know, we can curate some, like when we find, okay, JJ or, you know, when we get interesting people on opposite sides, we could say, you know, this would be a really interesting circle these four people yeah. and ask them if they would be willing to do a circle with each other and could we organize something like that? Yeah. Yeah, so the Saturday ones is sort of an open house. Anyone can come repeatedly and from there we can start creating other groups that are kind of more uh, curated than exactly. kind of during the week or something. And topics may come up. like Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, cool. and, and I'm wondering, Edwin, if I, I try to come up with some question, if this, like I'm hearing this is something you've been struggling to come yeah. up with, and I can try to think of as well on, on my own. And, and I was wondering as well, what about doing a survey of people? What would you like to, what questions, uh, what, what there, is the question that really is on your mind um, most of the time? I don't know, something like that to see, for people, to, for people like Megan to be able to, say like well i'm wondering how i can empathize with my with an abuser or uh with a nazi person that's yeah crazy. like you were you couldn't empathize with trump right so you couldn't be for the how can leftists empathize with trump so uh just a quick showing here there is a page you know on our bridging the vibes there is a topics page Oh, okay. Can so I? you can go there, and it also you can, and there's a whole list of uh, topics that people have suggested, and you can also click through, and there's a uh, poll. Oh, here. you already have stuff in place. Yeah, okay. so we've got that. So the one that was the most was role of racism, sexism. How might we bridge divides? Uh, how might we support constructive dialogue? So there's already some. So you can add them there, and also kind of uh, okay. hear from other people what uh what, okay. what so we can ask we can kind of get a sense of what topics people would like we can just keep adding to that poll okay i'll add some question in the poll then did jj say whether he was a trump supporter he didn't mention that no he he said he was from far right but he didn't mention trump supporter but he was it's i would say so i would imagine so yeah. he was really you know for against identity politics and you know a lot of the topics um I, I would imagine so i'm not i couldn't say for sure he didn't say it but i would imagine so which was great he, it was really good to have him to take part mm -hmm. i think most of us are against identity politics uh, on our side too did that not come up that way? It actually did. It's like everybody was, you know, was kind of sort of agreeing with uh, problems of identity politics uh, to, you know, uh, you know, I had concerns about it and sort of art and... Did you participate? I did. Uh, 
did, yeah. And talking about that, like, how was the overall the the MC? Like, was it okay? Do you think everybody understood? Like, the everybody loves your accent. <laughs> <laughs> so sexy. <laughs> It's this really weird thing for me because it's like it doesn't show anything about if I'm if I'm doing a good job. Like they just like and they don't even hear what I'm saying. Oh, I'm <laughs> They're all mesmerized. <laughs> to know it was good. Yeah, it it, just, it held the space. You kind of went through the steps. You know, it, I, 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 it was. You know, you know, you know what I would say is I noticed. I mean, I don't know how clear. Like when you hear me, is it very clear? Yes. Because I know, like, you're not totally clear to me. And I noticed, oh. I noticed that Evan was wearing a headphone with a, with a oh. <clears throat> And he was super clear. I do have that, actually. So maybe next time I'll have yeah. that. I mean, sometimes, like right now, you were very clear, but sometimes you're not. So it may have to do I'm going closer to the, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So, so the when headset you know, is facilitator. It's probably good to have a headset or an external mic. Is that, is that a computer mic? Built in. It's a built in, but I do yeah. have a Wi Fi, like mm. free wireless, uh, wireless headsets. Yeah. So uh, either you have to figure out like where to be and not move too much, or maybe you should wear a headset. Yeah. I, I wear my headsets. I do have some, so I'll do that. Oh, great. I don't want to be like standing all <laughs> near my computer. So yeah. I right. move too much. <laughs> right. So we, we could try, we could test that out anyway. Just test it. We yeah. could tell you what sounds best, you know. Yeah, I think uh, having more, you, you heard like even JJ, you know, even he, he had seen some videos before. And so that kind of prepares people. So it's really having all those videos out there, I think kind of gives people like a first step. So it's, they're not coming in totally cold. And if we can create some introductory videos, so they, they have a more of an introductory video, which I've been wanting to create forever. And then they can see some samples, then they get it a bit of an introduction. Then it kind of really helps with kind of smoothing. What do you mean by the introductory video? I thought you guys, I thought you already have some. Oh, uh, no, I mean a video that kind of introduces the empathy circle. Like this is how you do the empathy circle. These are the steps, these are the issue problems. Like a, you know, like a five or 10 minute good quality introduction. Oh, just like you gave the introduction, yeah, so they they could, could, it wouldn't be able to cut it from a, an empathy circle that, like for today, like to just cut the introduction part to, in the meantime, if, I'm sure you would want something a bit more clean. But Yeah, I yeah. did that. Yeah, I've been doing that. So I, I yeah. cut yours from the one you did and the one from Lou, too. So okay. now I'm trying to put that together. I did cut that. So okay. I'm working on it. I'm gonna need to take off soon. Um, so, but it was it was fun. It was great, uh, and I'm really looking forward for next year to do more on uh, my 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 concern. You know, Edwin is more on climate change, and I'd love to right. uh -huh. uh, do more conversations about that. I, I love the conversation about it today, um, and I'd like to hear more about what people think of that. Oh, and I got a new strategy for creating the the event. There's within the group you can create an event, a Facebook event. So I'm gonna go through and create the next four weeks, the events, and then you can invite everyone, and then you can also invite friends too. So it'll be a way of kind of getting the word out. So not just the poll, but actually creating a Facebook event. So I'll, I'll set that up. And, and you're the only administrator for the group, right? Like other facilitators cannot create events? Um, I'm not sure, actually, Evan is a facilitator too. I can add you to whoever wants to facilitate and I can make a, there's two levels of facilitation. There's yeah. full, full facilitator and sort of a administrator, you know, so it can yeah. make people administrators. So it, I think it gives you more, you can invite people and, and a lot, you know, bring them into the group. And so there's other things but like we that. Could not, we could not be able to we cannot create our own events. If I, if I want to create an event in a group, I cannot do that. You have I'm not to sure. I, I just saw it yesterday. So I'll, we're trying to figure that out. I think you should be able to, so we can test it out. You can go to events within the Facebook group, go to events and see if it gives a button to create event. So 
Okay. And then if it doesn't, I can give you, uh, I can give you permissions to be an administrator and then we'll see if that works too. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay, cool. uh, well, thank you so much. And well, I guess I'll see you next year, Edwin. And Dave, I hope I'll see you again in another empathy circle, French or English, whatever. <laughs> you will. <laughs> She's going to France so next week. Or yeah. All right. For a couple of weeks. Okay. Great. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> How did JJ hear about us? Do you know? Um, he found us on Facebook somehow. Are you recording? No. No. Oh, yeah.